All rise. The Court of Appeals, Division One, is now in session. Thank you. Please be seated. Good morning. We're here for oral argument in case number one, CSJV 18-0015, Department of Child Safety, SP uh, versus Juan P. Uh, Council, remind you that we are recording uh, this oral argument, so I ask you to please identify yourselves and who you represent at the beginning of your arguments. Each of you will have 20 minutes in which to argue your positions. Uh, appellant's counsel, if you'll please rem uh, remember to watch the clock and re re retain as much time as you would like for rebuttal. We won't uh, uh, remind you, but you can just do it yourself. So also, please keep in mind we've read the briefs, we've conferenced the case, and are familiar with the uh, basic procedure and the facts as, uh, as much as we could in this expedited time briefing and I appreciate your um, participation in that. With that, counsel for appellant, you may proceed. Good morning, your honors. May it please the court. My name is Joanne Falgott and I'm representing the Department of Child Safety in this matter. Um, I would like to try to reso reserve about five minutes for rebuttal. I'll obviously try to keep an eye on the clock as well. Um, under Arizona Revised Statute Section 8-861, Return of the Child, and Rule 59 of the Arizona Rules of Procedure for the Juvenile Court, the parent can move to have the child return to his or her custody at any time after the temporary custody hearing. And the court can return the child if the court finds, by a preponderance of the evidence, that the return of the child would not create a substantial risk of harm to the child's physical, mental, or emotional health or safety. Counsel, whose burden is that to show? That is the parent's burden to prove that. They are the ones bringing the motion, and there's a bunch of case law cited in the Department of Child Safety's closing argument in the trial court on that very issue. Uh, and, I, and I read those. I read, the, or I, I looked at the those citations, many of them are, of course, summary judgment motions, civil proceedings. Um, our research hasn't, well, have you found any any juvenile cases that are on, I didn't arguably find, on point? I, I didn't uh, draft the closing argument in the trial court. I didn't find anything that would suggest otherwise in the juvenile court arena. Uh, typically, when the Department of Child Safety is bringing motions, obviously it would have the burden of proof. So it seems like an awful lot of times the Department of Child Safety has the burden of proof in these kinds of proceedings. But here is uh, the statute giving the right to the parent to ask that the child be returned. And so uh, juvenile cases are, in fact, civil proceedings. And so the general civil rules of procedure apply to the extent that they don't conflict with the juvenile rules. There are no juvenile rules stating that the burden is anywhere other than the moving party, which is typically where the burden lies. It what about, Council, what about the fact that this is a situation uh, where uh, the government is seeking to keep a parent from their child and there is a constitutional fundamental right to parent your children? Absolutely. And when the department filed the dependency petition and proved by a preponderance of the evidence that their, the child was a dependent child, they met that burden. And now that they have met that burden and the child is in custody, um, because again, it, it's only after the temporary custody hearing, so the court has at least found that there's, you know, cause to believe that this child is a dependent child, now that burden reasonably shifts to the parent to prove otherwise. Additionally, the standards for a finding of dependency and returning the child are not necessarily the same. A child can remain dependent and still be returned to the parent if there is not a substantial risk of harm to the child's physical, mental, or emotional health or safety in the short term. Additionally, if the child is dependent and services can be put in place, then potentially the child could be returned to the parent safely and the dependency maintained until the parent has completed whatever services are necessary to ensure that the child can remain safely with the parent on an ongoing basis. So there's a little difference of, of standard there. But at the same time, again, the, the department has already met its burden to show that this child needs to be in the care of somebody besides the parents. There is no parent who is able to parent this child appropriately. And so if the parent believes otherwise, they're able to parent either with services in place or on their own for you know, while the dependency continues and additional decisions are made and additional evidence is produced, then that's their burden to show that. 
and so that it, that would in fact be the parents burden to prove that council well, to what extent do, do we know from the Superior courts a minute entry ruling and uh, closing arguments that were incorporated by reference do, do we know if the or do we presume that the court did apply that burden here? I think you look most closely at the written findings that the court made in the signed minute entry, and I understand that she incorporated by reference the stuff in the closing argument of opposing counsel, but that's a little bit unclear exactly what that means. Uh, to the extent that she incorporated any finding that the burden of proof is different, that would be an incorrect legal finding. To the extent that she incorporated many of the facts that are incorrect and not based on evidence in the record, that would be incorrect. So I think the, the most important piece of the, of the puzzle is the court's written signed minute entry. And that also contains numerous findings that are a, irrelevant to the sole issue on appeal, whether returning the child to father would create a substantial risk of harm to the child's physical, mental, or emotional health or safety, and B, a lot of findings of fact that are not supported by the record. Counsel, so. your brief um, alludes to the fact that the Superior Court um, essentially uh, granted father's uh, motion as a way to punish DCS for misconduct, correct? And that is what the tone of the minute entry sounds like, the court talks at length about it, its view of DCS's malfeasance in the case, which again is not really supported by the record, but even if, even if it were true, is not relevant to the issue, which is whether, given all of that, is the child going to be harmed by sending him to live in Mexico with What are father? some ways that the court can address uh, misconduct by DCS if, if not in this fashion? Well, certainly the court has uh, lots of authority to enter orders, and the court has done so in this case, ordering various services to occur, and those have occurred. Um, and, you know, one hates to suggest this in any particular case, and I don't necessarily think it's appropriate in this case, but if the court were to find it appropriate, certainly there are contempt proceedings available. Um, the court does have other ways to address any uh, malfeasance, but harming the child certainly should not be one of them. Counsel, you have an argument um, in your brief that whether father is fit is not the issue. It's whether father is fit with respect to these special circumstances. And you provide a couple uh, hypotheticals, including uh, a special needs child, uh, one or two children. But I, I don't see you explain what the special circumstances are here. Okay. What are those? In this case, we have a parent who speaks one language, a child who speaks another language, and neither of them speaks the other person's language. So there's a communication barrier. We have a child who has been in care for a substantial period of time and has no established relationship with the biological father. And despite the foster parents and the department's efforts to, to help fix that problem and, and uh, have a relationship start to develop, the psychologists at the Rule 59 hearing both testified to severe concerns about sending a child, a young child, six at the time of the hearing, almost seven now, to live with somebody who they have, they don't know, they don't have any established relationship with, can't even speak the language, and who at the visits has not shown appropriate empathy for the child's emotional state and the child's emotional responses. And so, so you have a, sort of a pattern of the, the father not making any efforts to learn the child's language and not making any efforts to understand the child's emotional needs and, and meet them. Uh, additionally, the father had testified that he you know, would have services in place in Mexico, but when asked, couldn't identify with specificity what services those were. In other words, he said he was going to have a psychologist lined up but couldn't provide a name, had not provided any documentation to the department, and the case manager testified they had received no documentation about who the therapist would be or even that there was one. Stated they had, you know, signed the child up for school um, at their local school, which, of course, would be Spanish-speaking, and were still looking into having... Um, a, a special school where English is also spoken so that the child could, could keep up academically, but hadn't yet finished investigating that possibility and really had, you know, not arranged for anything concrete at the time of the hearing. And your, your, your argument 
the sort of the, the back half is that um, that um, <clears throat> want the appellee here would be a fit parent for for other kids. Who, who are those kids that he would be a fit parent for? Well, for example, he has older children in his home, and there's no allegation that he's not a fit parent for those children who have lived with him since their birth and who speak Spanish and uh, are, are doing okay. But when you have a child, this child has been through substantial emotional trauma. This child was brought into care at the age of about three. His mother was using drugs. She also had cancer. She eventually died of cancer. Um, he was in a foster home, but the foster mother then had medical problems, and he was transferred to this foster home. And each time, he becomes more and more withdrawn. And the foster parents testify about this at the hearing, about how withdrawn he was when he first came to them and how hard they had to work to draw him out of his shell. They tried speaking Spanish and English, and they tried lots of things to reach this child. And you know, over time, were able to draw him out of his shell. The psychologists have testified that father does not demonstrate that level of empathy with the child. When the child says something that he disagrees with, father sort of clams up and doesn't respond and doesn't draw him out or attempt to engage him further. And that those kinds of responses are going to lead to potentially um, a devastating effect on the child. Um, I believe it was Dr. Lamont, yes, testified about the impacts of traumatic loss on children and that this would indeed be a traumatic loss at page 107 of the um, April 5th transcript and, and, and the pages thereafter, talking about how trauma um, changes the chemistry and structure of the brain. It can imp impact emotional functioning, social functioning, physical functioning, functioning in the envir environment and academic functioning. And the potential for this child to experience those ramifications is significantly high, if not guaranteed, if the child is sent to live to Mexico in an environment where he can't relate to anybody, he can't speak the language, and there's not that empathetic response coming from the father. In um, Maricopa County Juvenile Action Number JS5209 and JS4963, that's 143 Arizona 178 at page 187, the court talks about it being appropriate for the court to consider the children's special needs and whether a parent can meet those special Council, needs. what page was that? Page 187. I'm sorry? 187, 187. 187? Mm-hmm. And um, that's from 19, this court, 1984. And, uh, and whether the parent is able of or capable of exercising proper and effective parental care and control of a particular child, not just children in, gen in general. And I didn't find, uh, you know, at this time, I, I can certainly provide some supplemental authorities if the court is interested. But really, that's a psychological concept that's based on can this parent meet this child's needs? It's not necessarily based on the statute, but the cases have recognized that certainly that can be taken into account. If a child, you know, again, the examples in the brief are frankly ones that have been memorandum decisions in cases I've had, but obviously I can't cite memorandum decisions, but they certainly are examples where courts have recognized that it's appropriate to note when a parent isn't able to meet this child's needs, even if the parent is okay with additional children. We have this all the time also in juvenile cases where, you know, some children may be removed and even parental rights severed, but subsequent children are born and the parent is parenting them okay, and those children are either not removed or returned to the parent. So it's it's not always a one-size-fits-all. I don't think anybody wants it. We've got constitutional rights at issue. You don't want it to be a one-size-fits-all approach. If, if the man is found incompetent to parent this child, we're, you know, we should go remove all of his other children. Well, sometimes, but not necessarily. It depends on the circumstances. And so um, in this particular case, all of the evidence at the hearing, including father's own witnesses, demonstrated that returning this child at this time will cause harm. Now, again, the department isn't saying never return this child. Dr. Vega, father's own expert, said any, any transition would need to be, quote, slow. That implies that if it's not slow, it's going to harm the child. And How could that happen under these circumstances? <laughs> Well, one thing that has been ordered is some in-person visitation, and there was a lot of initial difficulty getting that set up. I think I outlined that in the brief about the difficulties in, in obtaining first an, a correct court order with the correct name and date of birth and information in it in order to get the passport, obtaining the passport from California, filing the application for the passport. That finally was obtained at the beginning of the summer, and then there 
one um, in-person visit did take place. The case manager who took the child down to the visit stated that she didn't feel safe on the visit and she didn't want to go again and they had difficulty finding somebody else to take the child and I believe by the time of the hearing there hadn't been additional in-person visitation um, and it's beyond the scope of the record but that that process is, is ongoing. Um, but but let me interrupt. If, if if we were to agree with DCS's position here and and vacate this this Rule 59 order and send it back to the Superior Court, where now? Where does this case go? Um, if I'm if I understand the record correctly, the case plan is reunification uh, concurrent with severance and adoption. Actually, uh, currently, or is it just only case, currently is it only reunification? Well, I guess. Or I, and then second is is there a pending? motion for term termination. There is no pending motion for termination. The judge dismissed that over DCS's objection after it was pending for almost two years with never a hearing having actually been held on it. Um, the department is okay with that for now. They're doing their best to provide re reunification services including therapy for the child, visitation um, you know, for the father, and also therapeutic visitation which they've been trying to set up with the assistance of DIFD which is the Mexican equivalent of the DCS and um, and again, I'm hesitant to go beyond what's in the record here, but that you know, prog they're they're working on it, and and presumably progress will be made. Um, at the time of the hearing, however, sufficient progress had not been made in order to reunify this child without causing substantial, as the experts testified, mental and emotional, almost definitely, and potentially even physical. Uh, Dr. Lamont and doc talked about how. Um, or maybe it was Dr. Caps Conkle talked about um, the concept of adverse childhood experiences uh, potentially causing, yeah, that was Dr. Lamont, talk, uh, potentially causing substantial negative health outcomes, including an increased risk for heart disease, cancer, depression. There, um, if you have four adverse childhood experiences, you are 12 times more likely to attempt suicide. Well, this child has already been removed from his mother, removed from his prior foster family in traumatic situations. He's well on his way. <laughs> so at this point, returning this child without facilitating this relationship further is, is going to be harmful to the child and that is the sole issue. It's not about whether DCS provided services, it's not about whether father participated in them except for the statutory provision that if the father had failed to participate in them that could be considered as evidence that returning the child would create a substantial risk of harm. But the, the father's participation in those services simply removes that negative inference. It doesn't necessarily provide a positive one that no harm will result. And so really there was no evidence on which the court could base a finding that no harm would result to the child. And that's the only issue right now. If To answer your question directly, if the case is remanded, the dependency continues, the reunification services continue, unless or until a severance motion is filed or the child is returned after the relationship has been built enough to do so. And I'm down to three minutes, so at this point, unless, Thanks. obviously I won't answer your questions, so <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Council? Thank you. Uh, good morning, Your Honors, and may it please the court. Uh, my name is David Lieb. I'm with the Maricopa County Office of the Public Advocate. I'm here today representing Father Juan P. Your Honors, we're here today because the appellant essentially in the brief is asking to reweigh the evidence in this case and asking this court to substitute its decision and its concept of what happened in this case with um, the juvenile court's own ideas. Your Honor, most cases in court are based on point of view. Obviously each party has their own point of view and in a case like this appellant's point of view would be much different than father's point of view. But the only point of view that really matters is the court's point of view. In this case, the court we're talking about, the juvenile court, had had the case for roughly four years, has had a series of contested and non-contested hearings, has read court reports, has reviewed various documents, evaluations, other things that are normally the day-to-day -day, uh, business of the juvenile court. At the hearing, the three-day hearing that lasted uh, Three half-day sessions was about four hundred dollars. Four hundred dollars, about four hundred pages, as I'm sure you're all aware of transcript. 
There was evidence, as even appellant states, there were psych evaluations saying that the father is able and fit to parent his children, two of them in fact. There was a DEEF conducted, a DEEF conducted home study that said father was able to parent his child in home, that the father had four other children in his home, including the full blood brother, older brother of the child in question here. Counsel? Uh, let, let, it, let me ask the same question we asked um, of your colleague, which is that of burden. Who had the burden uh, in that Rule 59E context? Your Honor, it's actually a very interesting question. Traditionally, as appellant stated, the burden would go to the movement. However, as I believe Judge Cruz mentioned, in a case like this where DCS kind of holds all the cards, um, the parent is out of the country in this case. The parent is supposed to do whatever services are provided or requested by the department. The evidence, as it were, or at least the ability to have expert witness and so forth, a lot of that evidence is going to come from, whether it's good or bad, is going to come from the appellant. Actually, in this so, oh. typically you're saying that the burden would be on father, but not here. Is that what you're saying? Your Honor, I think typically the burden would be on father, but in this particular case, uh, Rule 59 itself says that the court will consider evidence. It, Rule 59 doesn't say the court will consider evidence presented by movement or evidence presented by parent. It just says evidence to be considered, and that even includes hearsay. Um, the court will consider whatever evidence is before it. Much of the evidence that the court can consider may come from father, and in this case, father did present two witnesses, but there were five additional witnesses, and those additional witnesses also provided testimony. Now, again, point of view, the point of view of the appellant is that testimony is all strongly in favor of not sending this child home to father. Uh, however, you know, one thing that we deal with often in these cases is the court, again, who has had four years, numerous hearings, contested hearings, has done this case, is in the best position to weigh the evidence themselves, to consider what the parties say, to consider the credibility of the witnesses, to consider the disputed facts, and that's Jordan C. Actually, it's several cases, but primarily we'll go with Jordan C. Now, can I turn you back to burden of proof? Just sure. one more point a, or question. But didn't, as a practical matter, didn't the juvenile court treat this as father having the burden. I mean, you've got the, the motion, and obviously the your ability to do a motion and reply. You know, you get the rebuttal. And then also in closing argument, they, the, the father, your, your client submitted a, a rebuttal closing Correct. argument, in which, I mean, I mean, just in a general case, you don't get that unless you have the burden, correct? Uh, Your Honor, I'd have to agree with that. I think that the court in this case, uh, especially with the long history of this case, the previous appellate history in this case, the court did everything in its power to make sure that anything that should be obvious, such as the burden, is covered. Yes, she, the movement was father, father went first, father did the, uh, did the initial closing argument and the rebuttal argument. Uh, she treated father as though father had the burden, but I think when it's all said and done and we have the mass of the evidence, father, according to the court, and the court is in the best position to know, father proved that uh, by a preponderance of the evidence, which is not a particularly high standard, but father proved by a preponderance of the evidence that there would be no substantial risk of harm to this child if the child goes home to father. What are your best nuggets pieces, whatever, what are the best, most strongest points of evidence that support father's position that there, there is reasonable evidence to show there wouldn't be no mental or emotional harm to the child? Your Honor, the fact that this is father, that father did parent this child for the first two years of the child's life before the child came north, that the father, that there were two evaluations uh, one that was conducted by DEEF, by a DEEF hired specialist at the request of uh, appellant, the other that was hired by appellant to conduct an evaluation that both said father is capable of parenting a child. Father had a DEEF conducted home study that said that father is raising a relative may not be the exact quote, but father is raising a happy family with four, with four children, including the full-blood sibling, full-blood older brother of, uh, of the child in this case. That father has, uh, the runs, he runs a, a family business, a family restaurant business that he's run for several years and can easily provide support for his son. 
So I think, Your Honor, possibly the most, the evidence that's in the record that shows the most that father will provide for the emotional <laughs> and mental well-being of the child is that at every turn, in the evaluation by Dr. Vega, at every turn, father has gotten to the point where when he feels pressed, when he feels like, you know, I, I, he has acted as though he feels what he wants to do, it's in the best interest of his son. Yeah, he did testify that he wants his son home. This is his child that was taken from him, initially voluntarily by his wife, or not by his wife, but by the child's mother, and then essentially disappear, who disappeared a month later. But he tried to find the child. He got in contact with, with appellant when he found out that appellant had the child. He became involved. He called in. He's done everything that the department has asked him to do. But even, and I'm going to focus on that Dr. Vega report. At one point towards the end of the report, doctor even said, look, you know, if it turns out that what's in the best interest of the child is not to be with me, then we'll let that take its course. Um, but his desire, his goal is to be reunified with his child. Uh, but my, my, the, the fear father has is that this becomes less of an issue about whether or not there was any reasonable effort, evidence on the record and more an issue of, well, this evidence was better and bigger or this evidence was bigger, better and bigger or this is what our experts said. It, it's reweighing the evidence. And I know this court is yeah. hesitant to do that. And Dr. Vega made a couple of interesting points, additional points towards the end of his report. One of my, you just... Uh, referenced. I mean, he, he he actually said, "Issue of reunification is not one of parental competency, but is but rather it is one that involves the best interest of the child, which is beyond the scope of this evaluation." Which which seems odd. I mean, the, in a sense, because you're there on Rule Fifty Nine, and you know it it doesn't use the term best interests, but I think, I mean, the child's emotional well being would seem to be the best interest of the child. What we're looking at what's in the best interest of the child. So it, it's just, it just strikes me as odd that, that he would say that at the end of his report. I mean, not, not that he would say that, but that that seems to me um, to undercut father's position a bit about that. I mean, the, about the, the level of evidence, the strength of the evidence. I mean, I'm still having a hard time knowing that the evidence that shows where the child would not be adversely affected by this move. I mean, because Dr. Vega certainly didn't opine to that. He never met with the child, correct? He ne uh, Dr. Vega, no, never did meet never with, the met with the child. And um, so, yeah, there's there's a lot of evidence here. But, but necessary. I mean, I don't know that volume equates to reasonable evidence supporting what the narrow issue, what I see as a pretty narrow issue before us. Correct, Your Honor. And, and, and I think the important thing, as I think you alluded to here, is to remember that it's not the weight of the evidence, it's not the strength of the evidence, it's just that there was evidence for the court to consider in the grand scheme. Um, uh, appellant mentioned at one point, she keep, uh, Dr. Lamonti, or Dr. Lamont. Dr. Lamont, who opined in this case and was one of their witnesses at the hearing, never met the, never met the father. Dr. Caps Conkle never met the father. Um, you know, one of the cases that this court has recently decided in Alma S, which I know that the court actually made reference to in her final order. In Alma S, you know, the court, this court kind of said, well, just because you have an, an expert, a doctor, a psychologist who opines something doesn't mean the court has to accept that at face value or even that the court has to assign that the weight that the point of view of the appellant would grant it. Um, additionally, one of the things that she mentioned, and this was a part of her weight, I would imagine, or the judge in the juvenile case, uh, one of the things that was mentioned was, when you mentioned best interest, is the fact that, that the best interest, which has to be considered in every case, Rule 36 says every juvenile court proceeding, the, pr the, the preeminent thing in the judge's mind should be whether or not this movement is in the child's best interest, was the issue that what the point of view of propellant is, is that the best interest is, well, the child is happy and healthy and doing well with the foster placement. It's not that father can't, it's that foster placement is and might be better. And as this court said in Alma S, we're not going to, it's not a game of comparison when it comes to best interest, you know, um, as, um, but counsel, to, yes. to what degree do we factor in the child's 
um, emotional response to the proposed move. For example, if you have if you have a child who seems to be after a period of instability, finally becoming well-adjusted and reacts severely negatively to contact with the parent. To what degree do we factor that in, or do we just say, it's going to be tough, we're just going to set that aside and focus on the fact that father has parented other children and, and should be capable of m parenting this child and make everything okay down the road? Well, you know, I think some of the best evidence of that we've seen in this case was what appellant mentioned earlier about when the child was removed from mother initially, placed in a placement and had a hard time getting used to being in that placement. And then that placement, that foster parent got sick. They had to move the child to another foster placement. The other foster placement <laughs> had to go through all kinds of motions because the child was, I don't use the word damaged because no child should be damaged, but the, the child was emotionally traumatized by the move. And yet and each how old? of how old was he? At the time, the child was only two or three years old. Okay. And so the child was able to rebound with a loving parent, with a parent that was able to provide for that child. When the child was in a placement where that was just, just a Tom, Dick, or Harry off the street. Now, obviously, foster placements go through a little more than that. But if the child is able to rebound and be resilient in a foster placement after a traumatic event, we're sending this child home to be with father, to be with his parent. You know, the department or appellant made issue of, you know, that they've had a dependency made in this case. There was a dependency finding. What wasn't mentioned was that dependency finding came because department or the appellant had not yet found father, even though, as mentioned in the record, there was evidence. Not, he was not in contact in a part of the child's life. Your Honor, that is correct, but I don't think I, that is correct. But there's reasoning behind that that the court examined both in the original Rule 59, which I know the court has from September of 2016, as well as here. There are reasons why the father wasn't part of the child's life that had nothing to do with the father just giving up and saying, okay, I'm not going to do anything. What are those reasons? Well, Your Honor, those reasons are the father had sent the child with mother into California in roughly in May of 2013. He kept in daily contact roughly for about a month. Suddenly, mom's phone was disconnected. Father, as we know from the history of this case, father um, is has been deported from the United States, cannot legally return. He tried contacting mother's family. Mother's family wouldn't talk to him. He tried contacting his family in the United States to look for mother, to see, can you find her? Can you contact her? They couldn't find her. Father didn't know what else to do because mother is mother to child, had legal rights to the child. And father can't re-enter in the country, and he's tried to look from the ways he can. And, and do we put any weight on the fact that he can't re-enter the country by his, as a result of his own actions? No, Your Honor, I, I, I don't think we do, and especially in this case when we're not, I mean, it, and I know you guys are trying your best not to do this, but we're not going to reweigh the evidence. Why father came, left the country, the, the circumstances leading up, from the from the child being taken to the United States until father becoming involved in summer of 2015, that's history. How long how long a break was that? Uh, approximately two years, Your Honor. Um, so you're saying, just to be clear, um, you're not going to reweigh the evidence, and I understand that point. Do we consider it? Is it relevant? Your Honor, I, I think only the evidence that is relevant to whether or not father is able to care for this child, whether he's able to take care of this child without a substantial risk of mental, emotional, or physical harm. So let me ask you, would, would a criminal record be relevant to that question? Your Honor, a criminal, relevant, a criminal record may be, but I think the best party to generally to judge the relevance based on... Would, would, would a criminal record have any relevance in the Rule 59 inquiry? I think it might, depending on the recency, what the what the criminal event, whether what the criminal convictions on the record were, um, you know, whether or not, like you say, it was proven or whether it was simply alleged. There are lots of things to be factored into that. You know, it's easy to say father was deported because he had a criminal offense, but without more, you know, which is what the juvenile court took all this time and had all these hearings and evaluated. Without saying more, it's hard to say that just because there's a criminal record doesn't mean father can't parent the child effectively or that father can't provide a place for the child without risk, a substantial risk of mo emotional, mental, or physical harm to the child. 
What about the language barrier? Is that relevant in the Rule 59? Your Honor, absolutely not, and here's why. Um, we have all the time, we have children who are nonverbal, you know, small babies, infants. We have children that <laughs> unfortunately need to, be, need to be removed from their homes by, uh, by appellant because of circumstances in the home, whether it's the parent, whether it's the home itself. They don't automatically, the department, I would imagine, and for good reason, can't go and look for the exact match child language to language with a foster placement. Um, if you have a child who is de developmentally delayed and unable to speak or just make sounds, you know, a parent who's able to, who is fit and capable of parenting their child, there are signs other than language where they can tell if the child is in need, if the child is hungry, if the child is ill, if the child is injured, if the child is stressed. There are other ways to communicate those things besides language. Uh, one thing to bring up in this case is one of the four children in the house, in father's household, actually 19 year old, his stepchild speaks English. But that's again, I think a little beyond the scope here. What's important is whether father and, and I believe uh, appellant does say that father is able to speak some English at this point. So the language barrier is not a substantial risk. If anything actually happened to the child, if the child was traumatized, hungry, hurt, sick, those are all things that a good parent, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of country of origin, regardless of language, should be able to figure out about a child. Don't you think this child's, because of some of the history you've referenced, don't you think this child's needs go beyond being able to be fed, to be given water, to be put to bed, to be to, told to take a bath? Don't you think uh, this child's going to need uh, someone who can talk to him about the fact that uh, he's had to go through different placements, about how he's coping emotionally with the fact that he's in a new environment, about the fact that he, uh, from what we've heard so far, won't be able to communicate with people um, in, in school with his teachers? I mean, don't you think it goes beyond just the very basic needs of water and... Uh, food. It certainly does, Your Honor. Um, but, you know, first of all, just again to say it, I think the court needs to try very hard, and I need to try very hard myself. That we're not reweighing any of this. Well, we keep talking about that, but isn't this court tasked with uh, determining whether the Superior Court abused its discretion? Right? It, it is, but in this case, they're being charged with, the court has been tasked with determining whether or not this, the juvenile court abused its discretion by making a decision without having reasonable evidence from which it could draw that conclusion. Right, and so we look to the evidence to see whether there was reasonable evidence to draw the conclusions it drew, right? I, correct. I think we look to see if there was evidence there, but not to the weight of the evidence, the strength of the evidence, not to whether or not the testimony that provided the evidence was was strong or weak, whether it was, you know, well, what the credibility of those witnesses was. So just that, to list out the forms of evidence but don't assess how persuasive they are, is that, and then we could just, whoever has more evidence... Well, no, not even whoever has more evidence, Your Honor. I mean, yes. and are we supposed to look at evidence and, and assess whether or not it's reasonable evidence? Well, Your Honor, I think the assessment of whether it's reasonable evidence is simply whether or not the evidence was there on the record from which the judge could make her decision. There's no quantum of evidence. Like you said, it's not how much. It's not an issue of weighing it. It's not an issue of, well, we have 20 and you have 10. It's an issue of, is there something there that combined with all the other evidence, combined with everything else that this trial court knew, that this trial court has experienced in four years of this case, in three days of a hearing with just 400 pages, in 10 exhibits, in seven witnesses, with cross-examination, redirect, in light of all of that, the question is, was there evidence that the court could have looked at and said, okay, based on how I weighed this, I believe that there's sufficient evidence to show, and in this case, by a preponderance of the evidence. Counselor, your time's up, but Judge Cruz would like to ask. Sure. Yes, Counsel, um, you, you mentioned, and, and to conclude on this note, you mentioned that the, ch the fact that the child was removed from mother and then removed from a foster placement and, and then was able to uh, attach to the current foster placement is evidence of the fact that he is able to attach even. Uh, and so, but, so is it your position that he'll be able to attach no matter how many times that happens, no matter how many times he's detached and has to reattach to someone else, he's, he's attached twice before, so we can do this as many times as it, as it takes? <laughs> your Honor, no. Um, it, it's that not- a, no effect? Well, Your Honor, 
there are two ways to look at the question you're asking. And one is that, no, obviously that a child cannot go through that endlessly. But at the same time, the child, either we're deciding right now that father's rights need to be terminated because this child cannot be detached one more time without there being damage. It, it, it's either the, either the child has been resilient to this point, the child is six going on seven years old, the child so far has shown resiliency to be able to be placed with another placement. We're not talking about with another placement. We're pl talking about placing this child with the child's father, with a father who has the fundamental constitutional right to parent their child. And again, there's risk, which that might be a risk, Your Honor. I'll grant that's a risk. However, whether or not that's a substantial risk. And last, I know that I said that would be the last, but can you give me the, the timeline? So the child is born, and how long did he, it, he was born here and was with father? Was with father in Mexico. Um, oh, he was born here, wasn't he? was born it? here. At the time that father was deported, mother and father both went back to Mexico. And how old was child? Uh, infant. Uh, the child would have been probably right around just a few months old. Very, very young. Because it would have been in 2000, I believe 2011 or 2012. When he was de deported? When he was deported, when father was deported. Right, so that would be, I think, one year exactly right. after birth. Um, so then child lived with father until mother took child into California in May of 2013. Lived with father and mother? I believe primarily father, mother was kind of coming and going between California and, and I'm not sure whether the record honestly shows that, but was going back and forth. And then in May of 2013, uh, mother had come down for a visit with father and actually both children, both child in this case, and his older brother in Tijuana. Um, mother asked to take the child back to California to visit family. Father said, okay. Mother and father kept in daily contact until mother disconnected her phone. And then the rest of the case is as we know it. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Thank Mother you, Counsel. Thank you. trying to decide where to start here. <laughs> Numerous things that I could rebut. I don't want to waste the court's time with stuff that really isn't relevant. So I just want to focus on the key issue, which is whether this child is at a substantial risk of harm. That's emotional, mental, or physical harm by being returned to father in Mexico. It was not the department's burden to prove a negative that the child would not be sub subject to that harm. It was not the department's burden to carry the proof for the father who was the one making the motion. Father talks about having three days of hearings and all this evidence, but he didn't present any that actually supports the juvenile court's conclusion that no harm would result to this child, that there would not be a substantial risk of harm to the child's mental or emotional or physical health or safety by being returned at this time to father. Father talks about saying that this means essentially that the court is terminating father's parental rights at this time. That is not true. The dependency would continue, services would continue, attempts to build a relationship between father and the child would continue, and if that re relationship can be repaired, at least to the point, or the other part of this is that the child has severe anxiety issues and is in therapy. He's got his own therapist where he attempts to work through some of these issues. And if the child gets to a point where he is resilient enough to handle an abrupt change, then reunification could occur. There are lots of things that it could occur. A guardianship is a possibility. The father's parental rights are not being terminated in this proceeding. The only thing being decided in this proceeding is whether the child should be sent to Mexico as the judge ordered, quote, immediately. And all of the evidence at the hearing supports the opposite of the conclusion from what the judge found, that in fact the child would be harmed. Even father's own expert said any transition should be, quote, slow. There was no attempt on father's part to draw out what that might mean. 
whether that means in-person visitations building up to overnights, as is the usual transition method through DCS. Council, Dr. Vega wasn't necessarily father's own expert, was he? I mean, wasn't it hired by DCS? He was hired by DCS, but my understanding was he was at least selected. He was, um, well, I could be wrong. I, I don't recall exactly, but he is the one who did the initial assessment, met with father, and father is the one that called him as a witness at the hearing and um, presented the idea that this expert had concluded he's a fit parent. Nobody's disputing that father is a fit parent for his other children, but returning this child to this parent at this time will cause a substantial risk of emotional and mental harm. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate your arguments this morning. The court will take this matter under advisement and issue a decision in due course. The court is now adjourned. Okay, thank you.